Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater at the National Archives. Wonderful to see you all here on a beautiful, finally, spring night. Uh, my name is Tom Mills. I'm the Assistant Archivist for Regional Record Services for the National Archives. My office operates 17 record centers and 13 regional archives around the country, from Atlanta to Anchorage, Boston to San Francisco, and points in between. It's another way that the National Archives serves all the citizens of our country and makes records accessible uh, for public accountability, protecting individual rights, and making sure that we preserve our national memory. Now, one uh, unique uh, uh, responsibility of my office is to lead our, our, that is the National Archives, collaboration with eight affiliated archives of the National Archives. Now, an affiliated archives is an educational or archival institution that has physical custody of selected National Archives records. The records, though, actually be legally belong to the National Archives. Um, the eight affiliated archives are taking care of them for us. And one of those affiliated archives is the Pennsylvania State Archives, which gets to the topic of our discussion tonight. Uh, the Pennsylvania State Archives preserves uh, the letter book and related records relating to General John Frederick Huntraft, who was responsible, of course, for the pr prisoners charged with the complicity in the Lincoln assassination. It's the Huntraft letter book, uh, in effect, the diary uh, that he kept that launched the publication project that forms the basis for tonight's conversation. And here with us tonight are the co-editors of the new book, Harold Holzer, closest to me, and Edward Steers, Jr., um, in the middle, the co-editors of the recently published by LSU Press, The Lincoln Assassination Conspirators, Their Confinement and Execution as Recorded in the Letter Book of John Frederick Hartraft. Let me uh, take a moment to introduce our distinguished scholars. More information is available in the brochure. Let me hit a few highlights. Harold Holzer is the co-chairman of the U.S. Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission and the author, co-author or editor of 33, 33 books on Lincoln and the Civil War era. Could be more. It's, you know, this was, I, I knew that. 34 going on 35. Hard to keep up. In 2008, Harold was awarded the National Humanities Medal given by the President for work that expands and deepens our nation's understanding of the humanities. His award-winning books include Lincoln at Cooper Union, which won a 2005 Lincoln Prize, the most, most prestigious in the field, and Lincoln President-Elect, just released this past fall. His uh, program, Lincoln Seen and Heard, with actor Sam Watterson, has been nationally broadcast uh, on a variety of uh, public channels. Our second distinguished scholar is Edward Steers, Jr., a leading authority on the Lincoln assassination. Ed has published 11 books, including the critically acclaimed Blood on the Moon, The Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, and Lincoln Lessons, Reflections of America's Greatest Leader. In recognition of his book, Blood on the Moon, he's appeared in seven television productions on History Channel, Discovery, PBS, dealing with Lincoln's assassination. Uh, the book was also featured by Robert Novak on CNN's Crossfire uh, in conjunction with the case of uh, Dr. Samuel Mudd. And for the Huntraft book we'll be discussing tonight, Ed was the lead researcher as well as co-editor with Harold Holzer. And joining us to moderate the discussion is our friend Michael Beschloss, and well known to those of us at the National Archives, and also Vice President of the National Archives Foundation Board. Uh, Michael, of course, is an award-winning historian and the author of eight books, including Presidential Courage and the Conquerors, Roosevelt, Truman, and the Destruction of Hitler's Germany. Um, at, at some point 
Newsweek called Michael Beschloss the nation's leading presidential historian. He holds honorary doctorates, two honorary doctorates, and is the recipient of the Order of Lincoln and the Harry S. Truman Public Service Award. In addition, he won an Emmy Award in 2005 for his work uh, on the Discovery Channel series, Decisions That Shook the World. Uh, so please welcome our distinguished scholars tonight, and I'll turn the program over to Dr. Becker. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you all very much for being here tonight, especially because I can now go home tonight and tell my wife I'm not the only person in Washington who would come to an event like this on a Friday night. <laughs> I feel in very good company, and we all thank you very much for being here. Uh, the thing that occurs to me most of all about this wonderful book, which, as Ed reminds me, is $24.95, fine bookstores <laughs> everywhere, available also online. Uh, is, you know, one of the things that historians, or actually two of them, think about is that even decades or even centuries after an important historical event, we sometimes come across a crucial historical source that can change our understanding of that. And I can't think of a better example uh, than what we're talking about tonight. You know, here we are this many years after Lincoln's assassination, and we've begun to change our views of the way that these prisoners were treated after that occurred. And the other thing, and this is going to lead to my first question, is we always like to think that a past historical event that we study will shed some light about a current controversy. And I think this is an even better example of that because, you know, it strikes me that when General Hartranft was dealing with these problems, how do you treat these prisoners? you know, who were vilified in most areas of the United States, at least the northern areas of the United States and some of the south, it was almost roughly, and this is not anywhere near an exact parallel, but as if we had captured Osama bin Laden after 9-11 and a few of the other 9-11 conspirators, and we were going to put them in a prison somewhere, how do you treat them? With a public extremely angry and very eager for revenge. So the obvious question is, especially this week, people have been talking about whether America has done the right thing with Guantanamo and the way that we've treated some of the other prisoners and detainees. And why don't we start with Harold? What do you think that the experience of General Hartranft shows us about the kind of questions we're dealing with now? I think most of all it shows that uh, there's never a final answer to the question that you just posed. What might have seemed like inordinately humane treatment by a, um, a rather understanding, compassionate, though tough-minded uh, supervisor of a prison, um, meaning allowing exercise, removing padded hoods for most of the prisoners at a certain time, making sure that Mrs. Surratt drank her tea and got off her little hunger strike binge or just inability to eat was seen, could have been seen as coddling at the time. And now, looking back at some padded hoods and balls and chains seems inhumane. So the answer is that there's, there's no answer, it's, but that it's an issue that calls out for constant analysis and reinvigorated discussion, because our mores change. About for those who haven't read the book yet, Tell us, I mean, there are some people who felt that the treatment was much too humane and some people who felt it was much too rough. Give us a sense of the case for each side. Ed, I mean, the people who were saying the treatment was not humane, would you rather do that, Ed? Well, no. sure. I, it if, was, you were, if you were someone arguing that these people were treated terribly and not in accordance with American tradition, if you're making that argument, what would you say? Well, it, it, it was both. It started out would appear to be very inhumane. I mean, these people were put in solitary confinement, hooded, shackled. Uh, the rules of the prison that Stanton drafted and insisted that everyone adhere to very strictly was there would be absolutely no communication with these people at all, except in the case of medical necessity, or as it says in the rule of call of nature. Um, it, it, it reminds me a little bit 
uh, similarities to the Nuremberg trials. Every cell had a sentinel posted at it to be relieved every two hours. Uh, no sentinel to serve more than once. Um, and, and as I said, all communication was strictly prohibited unless uh, under written order from Stanton uh, over his signature. Now, as time progressed, uh, they started to become lax and, um, and let up on the prisoners. I think, I think it reflected Stanton's paranoia. Uh, even as late as May 1st, when they were getting ready to go to trial, um, there were some, including Stanton, who thought that this cabal wasn't over yet, that there would be an attempt to free these prisoners. That, that there were other conspirators who were lying in wait. Absolutely. Um, he ordered an entire regiment to surround the arsenal every day uh, to be replaced by a new regiment every day, no regiment to serve more than one day. I mean, this, this required over 60 regiments that had to be used uh, throughout the trial and the assassination. So uh, security was extremely rigid. No utensils were given to the conspirators. They had to eat with their hands, and if it involved liquid, like coffee or soup, it was given in a bowl, and then the bowl was removed immediately. But as I said, as time went by, conditions began to change. Um, Hartranf began to make requests, and um, Stanton virtually granted every one of the requests. Okay, now why did he make the requests, and why were they granted? Well, I think Hartranf felt personally, that the conditions were much too harsh, number one. The prisoners really did begin to show deterioration mentally. I mean, they're in a cell that's seven by three and a half feet by seven feet high, and they're hooded uh, except when they ate. Um, and then, of course, when the trial started, the hoods were removed when they took them into the courtroom. Other than that, they were really in total solitary confinement and obviously, this began to work on the minds of some of them. Um, one of the rules required a twice a day medical examination by the post doctor, Dr. George Loring Porter. And he too uh, felt that the, the treatment was much too harsh. So the requests were made uh, to remove the hoods, which was eventually granted, to give them reading material to allow them to exercise by walking in the yard, uh, a dramatic change towards the end. And I, again, I think this reflected Stanton's relief of paranoia. He, he was now convinced that there wasn't going to be an attempt. Uh, what convinced him? Just the passage of time? Passage of time, I think, convinced him. Um, and so he, he, he relented, plus the fact that, remember, even though Johnson became president, Stanton was basically still running the country. I mean, he was calling all the shots. Um, and, uh, and so he had his hands full with the military and the army. And he was satisfied to turn everything over to Joseph Holt, who was the um, Judge Advocate General. And you can see midway through this trial where Holt takes over uh, almost entirely. When they were thinking of precedents for you know, how to treat these prisoners, what did they look to in American history? I don't think there were any there precedents. No precedents. So there was nothing that was at all parallel? Well, the murder of a president was yeah. unprecedented. Yeah, sure. Uh, and, but, and, but a great crime, federal crime. That but it was determined early that the trial was going, and this, of course, is where we have the useful parallels or the tantalizing parallels about now. The decision was made that it was going to be a trial by military tribunal, which is what puts all this in motion. Mm -hmm. The argument being that uh, the the victim was the commander in chief of the armed forces in time of war. Mm -hmm. An argument could be made that peace had been restored, and that a civil trial was in order. And the reason for a military tribunal is to impose law where the civil courts are not functioning. Mm -hmm. That was ironically the rule that Lincoln used in imposing military justice in, during, during the war. And actually, this trial wasn't used as a precedent later on by FDR when he had a military tri tribunal that led to the execution of some German yeah. spies yeah. who were here, I think, in 42. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ex parte Quirin, the eight uh, Nazi saboteurs uh, that landed in this country. And by the way, that was upheld by the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. 
interesting. When you got into this source, I mean, you knew about it, you knew some of the things that were in it, but what, what was the biggest surprise? I think the biggest surprise for me was the unrelenting routine formality that Hart Ramped imposed on, on, uh, on, on his work. In fact, let me stop you for a second for those who have not read the book and don't know that. Why don't you give us a little bit of a sense of who he was? All right. Well, he was, he was a, uh, um, an attorney. Actually, he was uh, admitted to the bar uh, about two weeks before Abraham Lincoln's election to the presidency. He was a Democrat in politics, and he was uh, a very prompt volunteer. Where, where was he in from? In Pennsylvania. Yeah. Raised a regiment. Uh, took a regiment to Bull Run and um, did not do well in that first encounter, to say the least. Uh, there were reports that he could not control his men, that his men, as they say, showed their backs to the enemy and fled. Of course, it was hard to tell because the entire Union Army was fleeing. Right. It was really hard to pick it on didn't our exactly hard narrow down people. the number. Of but he, his, his military career suffered, and it took him a long time to reestablish it. He did better in the West, and he had some good moments, and he, he actually won a battle very, 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 very late in the war. I think it was about three days before Appomattox, he captured some fort town in Virginia. But he had a, he had a good military record. He was a, a breveted as a brigadier general. And um, um, he changed in politics in 1864. He supported Lincoln over General McClellan, as did many military men. We know that 80% of soldiers whose votes were counted separately voted for Abraham Lincoln, even though McClellan was something of a, of a hero to them. And um, he was chosen to, for this task. And uh, um, working, reporting directly to Winfield Scott Hancock, uh, who, interestingly, I just have to skip to this because I found it a wonderful irony. In 1880, Hart Ramped was actually a contender for the presidency of the United States. That's how famous he became. Um, and he received something like 70 votes at the Republican convention. And Hancock wound up as the candidate of the Democrats in that election. Which is uh, how much of that was based on Hart Ramp's performance? Well, he was he became active in Philadelphia politics and 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 Pennsylvania politics. Ended his his career as collector of the port of Philadelphia, which was a very very good political post to have because um, no disparagement intended because this was the way of the political world. The collectors of the ports uh, got a percentage of the imports, not just a salary. But they were among the highest paid government officials in the United. States. Collector of the Port of New York really did well. I don't know how well the Philadelphians did. So this was a man, a man of order, a man of honor, a man who wanted things to be right, a man who remembered that he was once accused militarily of not controlling the situation. That's how I read the psychology. We didn't put the psychology in the book. And then he comes to this job and he takes it seriously and he files, and that was when you started by asking about the surprise. He maintains the tone of being honored to report. Ed and I wanted at one point to call this book, I Have the Honor to Report. I mean, we knew that nobody would get it but us, but we liked that. <laughs> every report, every dispatch, well, every Authors entry, have some rights. Huh? He had the honor to report. <laughs> very few. Right, very was, few, right. So he was a fascinating As guy. the title demonstrates. Yeah. Right. He but, was a man of, of order and, and principle and honor. And tell about his superiors a little bit and what that relationship was. His superiors. Uh -huh. Well, I, I just wanted to add a footnote sure. to that, that his, his role as military governor, which is akin to being a warden, was used against him uh, politically each time that he ran, um, that these prisoners were made to suffer inhumanely, particularly Mary Surratt, who became a cause celeb, the first woman ever executed by the United States government. So, it, and, and the cause... Tell about why it was a cause celeb. Well, because most people felt that she was innocent um, and that she was being railroaded by this illegal uh, military tribunal which lacked jurisdiction. And by a son, an ungrateful son. An ungrateful who didn't son show up who, to was, save her life. who was hiding in Canada at the time, saving his own skin, presumably. The idea was that if John Surratt would have given himself up and returned to Washington, 
the mother would have been freed. So that, that the government was really holding her and trying her to get to John Surratt, which would not have been a bad strategy because John Surratt clearly was one of the two key conspirators in that uh, cabal to kidnap Lincoln that later turned to us. Turn to assassin. I might mention the Surratt House, which is only a few blocks from here, is now a Chinese restaurant, right? The so, boarding house, yeah. Yeah, so just in case anyone wants dinner after this, that'd be a very appropriate place to. I think it's still called the walk and roll. Is yeah. it? Okay. Well, we're Don't not forget, getting any consideration for this. Ed, but, but, Ed has always made the point, which <laughs> to all the doubters who doubt guilt, complicity, and I think he makes a very good case in his other books that if you plot an illegal act and the illegal act results in death, even if the illegal act blossoms into something else, you're culpable for the original illegal act. Well, that's conspiracy law in the United States. You can't get around it. And that's um, why Mary Surratt, uh, well, we're not going to condemn her again, but that's why she was convicted. And that's why, well, Andrew Johnson's excuse or his, his rationale was, she, what was his wonderful line? She, she, she had the nest where the that where the gold with the poisonous egg. What, what is that? Mm. It's a great it line, magic. but neither no one of us remembers it. But it was the a nest. Really <laughs> uh, where the poisonous egg was hatched. Hatched. Where, where the rotten egg was. The rotten egg. Rotten egg. Rotten egg. That's right. rotten egg. But, it was but, but I would also nest. add that Hart Tramp had an excellent military record. He was a very good fighting general. He was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Yeah, but 25 although, years after the war. That's true. And. <laughs> And as was almost half the Union Army awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. But to his credit, there was a review board that took place many, many years later to reevaluate those awards, and the majority were taken back. But he was allowed to keep his. Now, I don't know if that was because of politics and he was such a strong politician or not, but, but there's no doubt he was a good fighting general. Um, and, and I think that's one of the reasons Stanton picked him as the military governor. He knew it was an onerous Job. Although Stanton didn't like him at full, Bull Run time. Stanton was highly critical of Hart Ramp. What happened was his regiment was a 90-day regiment, and the regiment time was up the night before Bull Run. Right. So it just packed up and right. walked off the battlefield. They weren't field. fleeing. They were going home. They were just going <laughs> home, and no amount, no amount of persuasion on Hart Tramp's part could convince them. So Hart Tramp then volunteered to serve on the staff of, a, of another general there, and did so quite well, and that was the reason he was given the Congressional Medal of Honor. And what did Stanton want from Hartranft? And basically, he gave him this responsibility. You know, it wasn't explicitly stated, but what did he want him to do and not do? He wanted him to, to adhere very strictly to those 28 rules that Stanton had written out, mm -hmm. rules that governed everything. Um, tell, from, tell a little bit about that. Well, it, it obviously it, it broke up into security of the prison and the arsenal and the security and care of the prisoners. It, it, it went in such detail as to how the prisoners were to be washed. They were to be, they were put in every other cell. So each cell was separated by an empty cell. That was also to preclude their trying to communicate with one another. He had a fetish about that. That was another reason for the hoods. Uh, Stanton he, did or Hartranft did? Stanton. Stanton did, yeah. Yes, Stanton. And um, he, he, he had uh, written out these rules that they were to be taken into the vacant cell next to the cell, stripped, allowed to wash, and given clean clothes. They did this each week that they were there uh, to eating. As I indicated before, no utensils were to be given to them of any sort. They were to be served in a bowl, bowls removed, no communication. One thing I found interesting was Stanton, and this shows, Stanton was a stickler as a lawyer. Um, and he was very concerned about attorney-client privilege. And he specified that the prisoners uh, could communicate with their lawyers but they had to do so in sight, but out of hearing of a sentinel. And uh, they took great care to make sure that took place, that all sentinels were moved out of hearing so that the lawyers could converse with the clients out of, uh, out of earshot. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Such things as no smoking anywhere on the arsenal ground, even outside the walls he had prohibited smoking. Um, but later on, 
again, as an indication of how he had relaxed the rules, he allowed the prisoners to each be given a chaw of tobacco at every dinner meal. Mrs. So, Surratt was particularly happy about well, that. Well, she, she liked her. <laughs> she got her sewing things done. She did get her sewing things. She was allowed to be moved to a separate room. Mm -hmm. And her daughter was allowed to stay with her and care for her. The room was the previous deputy warden's room that adjoined the courtroom. And so she was allowed to essentially live in this room with the door open so that she was within sight and hearing of the courtroom while the trial took place. So this idea of these prisoners being brutalized uh, and that it was inhumane treatment just simply doesn't wash. I like the, uh, one of the things that was revealed in the uh, letters that Hartramp also allowed them, I mean, this is something you don't think about, they were confined for, for months. He allowed them to get haircuts, ah. which was, I mean, Stanton would have objected to a utensil being anywhere in their vicinity for a while, but Hartramp, again, as, as Ed points out, made a series of bold but very orderly requests for amelioration of these very strict rules, and over a period of time, they were they were they were all granted. As far as we know, nothing was uh, not granted. Another thing that was surprising is that Hartramp had to, as, as Ed pointed out, with the with the new regiment every day, had to keep order in the vicinity of the prison. And every once in a while, somebody else had to get thrown into the prison, like the drunken guy who was yeah. yelling, "Kiss my ass, Abraham Lincoln." Uh, during the trial, out to, and, and was so disruptive that Hartramp had him put in his cell. So every once in a while, there were extra members of the prison population but, added but to the mix. He warned that guy twice. Right. Before, on the third time, he arrested him. <laughs> how, much of, how much of this was a political issue at the time? How much was there in the newspapers, for instance, these prisoners are being treated too nicely or treated too badly? Was it ever mentioned on the floor of Congress? I, I think that, you know, you have to get to the, um, the national mood at that time. I think mm. that's, where, that's where you have to um, take the pulse of treatment and reaction to the treatment. And it was, you know, 9-11 might have been similar in, in sort of the, the evocation of emotional. emotional mood in, in a country that was overwhelming. But in, in America of, of the spring, of eight, spring and summer of 1865, it was conflicting emotions. It was deep sorrow, uh, at least in the North. And it was a, concurrently a thirst for revenge, uh, always um, informed by a hunger for knowledge, a hunger for information, with the same intensity with which we watch 24-hour news when events are breaking. These people bought the pictorial newspapers to see the prisoners. They bought, uh, you know, they bought carte de visite photographs of John Wilkes Booth to put in family albums, not as a sign of votive um, uh, fascination with Booth or affection, but because he was a person in the news whose visage they wanted to look at. The Lincoln family owned a carte de visite of John Wilkes Booth, as astonishing as that might seem. So all of these technological aids to, to interest are, are, are evolving in sophistication and, and, and uh, um, frequency as this happens. So in this atmosphere, I don't think there was a great deal of sympathy for the prisoners. I think that, that Hartramp was actually fairly gutsy along the way to, um, to ask for some easing of the, of the, of the rule, these what we would consider Abu Ghraib-like inhumane rules. But I don't think there was a sentiment to relax them. And I, because I think, you know, Ed describes it as Stanton's paranoia, but there was a sense of national paranoia too, yeah. that they were guerrillas and uh, zealots who were not going to let the war end. And for or, a or while... Or even that there might be some Southerners who yeah. might try well, to get Well, for a while, Jefferson Davis was, was at liberty, so sure. that's another issue. Sure. Yeah. Uh, on the cover of the book is one of the most famous photographs of American history. Why don't you maybe, Ed, tell us what this is, what it's of, and how it came about. It's a picture of the hanging. The, the, the four, the, there were eight conspirators that were tried, uh, that were charged with Lincoln's murder. Four of them were, all eight were found guilty. Four of them sentenced to be hanged. Three were sentenced to life in prison and one to six months. 
Um, the trial ended on June 29th. The board of judges deliberated on the 30th and issued the sentences to be carried out on July 7th, one week later. And so this is a photograph of the four after the two traps fell, and they're hanging there. Uh, Alexander Gardner was selected by Stanton. Uh, I can't tell you why he selected Alexander Gardner, although Gardner was one of the most famous photographers in Washington. Who, at the who time. was he working for at that point? Himself. Himself. Himself at that point, but he had learned, he was a protege of Matthew Brady and had learned all of his techniques under Brady and then branched out on his own. Um, and Why would he have been chosen instead of Brady, for instance? Don't know. Uh, well, Brady I, wouldn't I, have been chosen for a very simple reason. He was what we would say today is legally blind. Mm -hmm. You could choose his studio, but he, Brady was a showman at that point. He wasn't a photographer. Mm -hmm. He couldn't focus the camera. Mm -hmm. So once Gardner split up and O'Sullivan split up and other guys started their own studios, they were the, the best technocrats out there. It's a very interesting thing because Stanton found out that there was a photograph taken of Abraham Lincoln lying in state in his coffin in City Hall by a very distinguished award-winning... which city hall this is. New, well, New York. For, for Harold, there's York's, only one city hall, but the one. rest of us... Uh, there, there are others? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> city Hall, New York. We're from Chicago. This is exactly the way we expect New Yorkers to behave. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Chicago people behave really well. Right. right. <laughs> anyway, we won't very, do this very rivalry. Clean politics and great governors. We, yeah. When Stanton found out, and this was taken by a very distinguished photographer named Jeremiah Gurney, award-winning photographer, really Brady's peer. When he found out that the photograph was taken, he had it confiscated. He had all the copies destroyed, but one of, of the picture of, of the Lincoln picture of the Lincoln lying in state, and yet. He encouraged, commissioned this. Now, it, you know, it was not done to be a keepsake on its own. It was given directly to Harper's Weekly and Frank Leslie's Illustrated newspaper. And you know, there it was for to, all to the do world an to engraving. See. They did woodcut engravings. Yeah. And there is the lesson for all would-be <clears throat> terrorists. This is your end. This is what will happen. You will be at the end of a world. That's and, why it was and, done. To and, and what happened in 1952? Not to lead the witness. The photograph was rediscovered. Oh, by my friend Ron Rietveld, uh, a, a young man who was given a, an assignment to work as an intern in the Illinois State 14. Historical Society. 14 years old. Four, I was 11. I was jealous. Yeah. No, it wasn't 11 in 1952. He was 14. He was a young man, and he found the existing photograph of Lincoln lying in state in the Nicolay papers. Stanton had somehow, or Nicolay, Lincoln's private secretary and future biographer had obtained the one surviving copy. And that was my inspiration to do Lincoln Research, Ron Rietveld. I thought, there must be more pictures like that out there to be discovered. Time's running out for me, but he... Yeah. And, and as Harold has said, there were actually a lot of counterfeit versions of this. Well, there probably were. There's a, one, there's a wonderful... There's a very accurate a lithograph that was published in Indianapolis that I'm certain was based either on a sketch or mm. a photograph. Lincoln was also sketched in his coffin by several artists in New York City. Um, the, some of those sketches survive, as do the Courier and Ives lithographs, which are based on life sketches. So, you know, there was a certain freedom about it in those days. And of course, people well, took also, death were, photographs. There were death the, masks, so this, it was a different culture. There different were death culture. photographs. Yeah. People specialized in death photography. They would mm -hmm. hoist up bodies with slings and take pictures to keep. If and even if you had a children, child, child who died earlier, absolutely. a baby. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, I wanted to come back to Having you. taken the conversation in this genteel and nice direction, <laughs> Ed, rescue to, us. To, surpri to what surprised us, because um, this really did surprise me, although it may, may seem minor. I, I looked at the number of visitors uh, that visited the uh, prisoners. And I was particularly interested, of course, in Dr. Mudd because of my interest in Mudd. And, we all know from the Prisoner of Shark Island or from the ordeal of Dr. Mudd or any of the other productions you've seen how Mrs. Mudd was so tenacious in his defense, getting him, his two lawyers, visiting him in prison, uh, supporting him in the courtroom. She never visited him once while he was in prison, nor did she visit any, the courtroom during any of the days of trial. 
uh, which kind of surprised me. I mean, I had expected just the opposite. And what, why do you speculate this was so? Uh, I have no idea. She, I was, think she was up with John Surratt in she Canada. Was, <laughs> I <assume. laughs> Something he probably was, told her, don't come. I'm, I'm just guessing. Right. But why? The one I thing, don't know. There were 50, 55 visits to right. the prison uh, by 25 different people, most of them lawyers, of course. Uh, the most visitors were uh, Davy Harold's sisters. He had seven sisters. Um, and they visited him routinely and were allowed to bring him food. They brought him strawberries and cream and butter and crackers. And all of that was approved by Stanton. Uh, but there was no visits to Dr. Mudd at all except by his two lawyers. Or Lewis Powell. Did he get just, as, just the attorney, but no personal visitors? I, right, Powell, no, Powell had none either. Well, Powell had no, no relatives friends, no or friends relatives. or anyone in this. He's from Florida, was a real loner. Um, I, I can't, I, Mary Surratt, of course, did have uh, visitors, uh, close members of the family. And they had friends, clergy occasionally. John Brophy. And then, of course, at the end, um, the touching scene is where Hartranf goes into each cell around midnight before the hanging and asks who they would like to have come attend them, uh, which minister they would like to attend them uh, in their cell before the hanging and on the scaffold, and they all chose their particular ministers who did uh, come and attend them. By the way, one, one thing about the photographs uh, on the cover of the book. That was your cue, Michael, just one more cue to hold up the cover. Oh, sorry. So because <laughs> Twenty-four ninety-five. <laughs> <laughs> the, it's one of a series. Uh, the reason I'm down. telling you, it's one of a series of photographs that Gardner exposed. He took series first, the empty scaffold, then the prisoners being brought up, then they're waiting. And Mrs. Serrata is sitting in a chair. People are holding umbrellas because it's sunny, even though they're about to to die. Gardner also got Hartram and his staff to sit for a photograph, uh, right, uh, probably on that day. And as oh, my yes. friend Ed Steers yes. pointed out, this should be my job to point out, but Ed pointed it out. I'm giving you full credit, especially if it's wrong. Um, <laughs> he had Hart Ramped and staff sit in the very chairs that were up on the scaffold a few minutes later yeah. to, be, to accommodate the prisoners and all. It's a little eerie, but that photograph is in there too. Mm. Everything for the photographers. Make way yeah. for the photographers. Yeah. Now, if I were Brian Lamb, I would ask, ask you who you dedicated the book to, but there's no dedication, so I can't ask. Uh, so well, you would say if we wrote it in a quill brings, in right. a bathtub. That brings up the point Indeed. of discovery. Uh-huh. The point of? Discovery. Uh, how we discovered this. or How, mean, how you discovered the, the source. The, the, the letter book. Yeah. In fact, I was going to ask. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad. It's a little out of sequence, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, no. This is I mean, lively and unrehearsed. Uh, well, no, this. <laughs> no, I just love this because having my entire professional career being in science as a molecular biologist, I know, I know that uh, serendipity plays a major role uh, on a routine basis. And while we know that uh, Hartranf took his letter book home with him, uh, and obviously remained with the family and descended in the family. It, uh, along with several of his other papers, were donated to uh, Gettysburg College. But people in the assassination field thought that the letter book was lost. We knew it existed, but we thought it was long lost, and people had searched for it and simply could not find it. Um, then one day, uh, Betty Owensby, who was uh, researching her book on uh, Lewis Powell, ali titled Alias Payne, she and her sidekick, Nancy Griffin, went up to Gettysburg College uh, to find out what they had on Hartranf up there that might pertain to Powell. Powell was it, in the Battle of Gettysburg, and he was captured and wounded. And so he was in the hospital there briefly. It wasn't a serious wound. And afterwards, he worked in the hospital as a nurse attendant until he escaped and made his way to Baltimore. So Betty and Nancy went up there to see what existed in the way of heart tramp. And the librarian brought out this stack of papers and plopped them down on the table. And they started to go through them. Out came the letter book. Well, they knew instantly what it was. And as Betty 
describes it to me. She jumps up and runs out of the building to a pay phone and calls James O. Hall, who was the dean of assassination scholars. And within two hours, Hall was at Gettysburg reading the letter book. And then by that night, we all knew about it because it made the telephone circuit all the way around. Betty and Nancy are here in the front row. Stand up and... It's, it's just one more beautiful example how, how you can't plan for any of these things and how serendipity plays such a marvelous role in research, which makes it so, so exciting. There's two other things in the Lincoln assassination that happened the same way, one being the To Whom It May Concern letter that Booth wrote, which was long thought lost, but showed up in a strange place in the archives. And um, For those well, who don't know what that was, remind us. Uh, well, John Wilkes Booth, before the assassination, wrote out a very lengthy letter and addressed it to whom it may concern. And it's a rambling letter justifying what he's doing and why he's doing it and um, for all of posterity. The letter he gave to his sister in Philadelphia. And after the assassination, she remembered she had it and turned, got it out of the safe, gave it to her husband, who surprisingly turned it over to a reporter from the Philadelphia Inquirer who published it in, in the next day's paper. But the letter itself disappeared, um, so much so that sometime in the 1980s, there were researchers who felt that it was a fabricated letter, that Booth never wrote it, that it was made up. But once again, James O. Hall, and searching through the archives, found it um, out of place, where it should, filed where it should not have been filed. And the third thing was the lost confession of George Atzerodt. Uh, while he was in prison, his brother-in-law and provost marshal visited him at his request, and he gave a seven-page confession. And when the provost marshal and his brother-in-law, who was assistant provost marshal, left, instead of turning the confession over to the prosecution, they turned it over to the defense attorney, <laughs> who, of course, deep-sixed it. And it didn't surface until 1977 in the attorney's papers in his home. But it was a wonderful discovery because it, it, um, it identifies Mary Surratt and Dr. Mudd as knowing all about it and being involved. Michael, I, I know you're going to probably ask the audience to pitch in in the, in the right. minute. Right. I've got two more questions, so I hope people will have questions. When I, I just want to echo what, what Ed said about... Um, the, the happenstance of discovery, but also the heroic work that it sometimes takes for archives to be built and maintained. Mm -hmm. And I just, may I acknowledge, do I quick acknowledgments? There are three separate parts of the room, but V. Chapman Smith, my old friend from Albany, now headquartered in Philadelphia, is the person who wanted so much to have the Hart Ramp papers published and available for a wider audience. V is right there. V, you should wave. That's great. <laughs> My friend Budge Weidman, who is a volunteer at the National Archives, has done more to preserve the history of African American involvement in the Civil War than anybody I know. She's there. <laughs> and if you think Maintaining archives in the 20th and 21st century is easy. Read the history of the Archivist of the United States and what he has done to make sure that future generations will have access that he had to fight for. So Alan Weinstein is a hero, too. Great. Very good. Terrific. End of commercial. And the, the chairman of the Mary Surratt Anti-Defamation League will also <laughs> stand up. I think she's here. Uh, right. She, <laughs> no. I, I've got two more, and okay. then I hope you all have questions and comments. Uh, the issue of whether Hartram wanted Mary Surratt pardoned, uh, there are people on both sides of the issue. How, how do you all come out? I think she, I think he, I think he was very careful not to venture an opinion, but to simply convey that there were people who wanted her pardoned. He was, his, his communication could not be clearer. He's doing his duty, again, in conveying a sentiment that, he, that someone else had expressed. And I don't think he ever voiced any public regret about the outcome. 
and that's that's my feeling anyway. I agree completely with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is the scholars who've written this. That's more speculation than anything based on the source yeah. we've got. Based on the excerpting that letter. Right. And the final thing, just to sum up before we come to the audience, is if you had to tell us you know, how how this does change what we knew about this episode before, you know, how has this moved the ball down the field? Now you look. Well, like. Every, every time I think about this and the assassination, I'm reminded of a statement made by Will Rogers, the great American humorist. I, I once said that to a group of, of young people a couple of weeks ago and, and were shocked to find out they didn't know who Will Rogers was. So. Yeah. There are a lot but, more famous people they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. um, but this group I know knows Will Rogers. Will, Will Rogers said, it ain't what we don't know about history that's the problem. It's what we know that ain't so. And no other words could be truer when applied to the Lincoln assassination. It is littered with myths and hoaxes, um, all the way from Mary Surratt and Dr. Mudd being innocent to John Wilkes Booth escaping to Stanton being behind Lincoln's murder to the inhumane treatment uh, how the prisoners were tortured throughout the trial um, and, and abused. Uh, so once again, I think it helps to set the record straight um, and, and give us a much truer picture of history. But I realize, however, that that's not really going to go away. Um, it, it's like Dr. Mudd. I've come to realize, after everything I've written and done on Dr. Mudd, I've come to realize he will remain an American folk hero. Uh, as far as the general public is concerned, and that's just life. Um, and it's, it probably will, this book will convince many people, those who read it, but for the general public, I'm sure they'll still think these people were greatly abused. Well, where does the general public get its information about this? The media, for the most part. Uh, certainly. Well, don't forget you had, you had Roger Mudd and, and the entire Mudd family including a very yes. sympathetic Roger was skeptical centurion. of the claim that Mudd was in. Yes, yeah. he was. He's who fought well, this battle but, for yeah. years, and, and for a, a perfectly you know, dreadful movie with um, Warner Baxter, <laughs> which has been aired on uh, Turner Classic Movies about 3,000 times, you get the sense that he was you know, the hero who was not only railroaded, but who um, cured the entire Florida coastline of yellow fever, and therefore was a, you know, a hero. So it... It's a very hard myth to kill. Bill, Ed is being too pessimistic. I think people are coming around to understand it in many ways. There are people who, you know, there are myths about every presidential murder that are very hard to put the stake in. But if you're asking how this ball rolled down the field and what it shows, I think it comes back to how you started this. That sometimes, sometimes very fortunate things happen in American history even though it seems like a minor episode with minor characters. Very often, America lucks out and has the right person in the right place at the right time. And Hartranf was, the, in his myth, methodical, yeah. humane, tough manner, he was the perfect person to administer justice. And in a way, he got, and because it was done so successfully, we got back to civil justice mm -hmm. because we got, went through this episode. And so maybe I, people didn't realize the magnitude of the accomplishment because it did happen. Absolutely. And because he lived a long time and had a different life. And, you know, he only lived to 59, but he had another career. Mm -hmm. And people wanted to put this behind us. Don't forget when John Surratt came back to the United States, he not only was, um, uh, went through two trials and, well, he didn't come back, he was captured in. in he was a papal guard, actually. Mm -hmm. Captured, came back, stood trial, think a hung jury, and then he was acquitted. And he wound up where my story usually begins. He wound up speaking about the assassination plot at Cooper Union in New York. <laughs> so life takes funny twists. You better hope that the right guy is in the right place right. at the right time. Absolutely. Or gal. Uh, we hope that you all have questions. We've got two microphones, one here and one here. And anyone who does, if you don't mind, just going over to the aisle so that you can be heard. Yes, sir. Uh, Ed, this is for you. You made an interesting comparison to Hartraff and Gilbert at Nuremberg. We know when the queer saboteurs were captured, 
Roosevelt goes and looks up the records for the military tribunal to set them up again. Uh, we know Burris Carnahan gets called out of retirement when we had uh, the Taliban fighters. Did you find any evidence um, that the Stanton rules were researched at all uh, in our current crisis as far as setting up um, treatment of prisoners and or the heart ramps interpretation of the rules? Uh, if I understand what you're asking, not as far as treatment of the prisoners, but I did receive a call from the Justice Department wanting to know the particulars about the military tribunal and uh, uh, Attorney General James Speed's uh, ruling that it had legal jurisdiction and the reasons why it had legal jurisdictions. And the subsequent cases during World War II of ex parte queer and the Nazi saboteurs and uh, in 46, uh, the military trial of General Yamashita, the Tiger of Malaya. They were very much interested in that and wanted to know as much details as possible. But never, uh, I mean, they, as far as I know, they never did uh, made any inquiries as to treatment of the prisoners. Thank you. Uh, there's a um, matter of uh, which has been uh, much speculated about with regard to the uh, Lincoln conspiracy, and I would steer this question to Mr. Steers. Uh, what are your speculations concerning, on the one hand, the conspiracy against Lincoln, and on the other, the Dahlgren raid? Oh, yes. Well, for those of you that don't know, um, Dahlgren was a Union cavalry officer who mounted a raid uh, on Richmond uh, in uh, March of 1864. Uh, the idea was uh, to, hit, to hit Richmond from the north and the south at the same time. Uh, let me back up. Richmond was, was very lightly protected and guarded. Lee had drawn off almost all of the good combat troops, leaving behind a home guard, if you will. Um, and so uh, it was felt that it would be relatively easy to free the Union prisoners on James Island, particularly since uh, Lincoln had gotten word that they were going to be moved further south to Andersonville. So this raid was mounted, uh, and it didn't work out. Uh, it was aborted, but in the process, Dahlgren was shot and killed. Uh, and the Confederates found on his body certain papers. And among those papers were instructions to enter the city of Richmond, find Jefferson Davis, kill him, and burn the city. Now, a great controversy has broken out over that and, and lasts even to this day as to whether those papers are legitimate or whether they were forged. Um, I think the majority of historians now come down on the side that they were legitimate. The question is, was this a rogue operation on Dahlgren's part, or did Lincoln know about, he certainly knew about the raid, but he, did he know about this part in which Dahlgren's orders to his men said to enter the city, find Jefferson David and his cabinet, kill them, and burn the city? Uh, obviously, violation of the laws of war. The idea among some historians is that the Confederacy decided that the gloves were now off. And if Lincoln could order the assassination of Jefferson Davis, Jefferson Davis could order the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And that the Dahlgren raid was really behind the plots to kill Lincoln. Uh, and it's still debated amongst assassination historians. The majority of them don't accept it, but there is a significant core that believe that uh, Lincoln's assassination goes all the way to the desk of Jefferson Davis, that he, he knew about it, he knew about the steps that were being taken and uh, had approved them, and that the Dahlgren raid was the basis for this. That's it in a nutshell. The only thing I would add is that Abraham Lincoln did not think he was engaged in a war. You know, he very rarely uses that term. It's not a legitimate war. They're not legitimate combatants. And his, his argument about 
you know, I know it's the, 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 that's not the question that this gentleman asked or what you address. But you have to keep in mind Lincoln's view, which he believed to be legitimate. Remember that when the uh, when he the emancipation is issued in 1862, and he's given a lot of praise in uh, in newspapers for finally doing it. He says, "You know, I'm getting all the praise a vain man could wish, but breath alone kills no rebels." He was into destruction and killing to end the insurrection and the rebellion, and he didn't see an equivalency. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Um, I'd like to ask a two-part question, if you will, and special greetings to Mr. Holzer. Uh, I've been struck by this, the balance between your quote of Will Rogers and the continuing thread that you wove through the dialogue tonight about discovery. And I'd like to ask what advice you might have for those of us who consider ourselves to be organic or self-taught scholars about entering this constant stream of discovery, rediscovery, facts which fall into us and then fall out of us again, as, as we begin to try to embrace the wide body of knowledge on this subject, what advice might you give organic scholars? And the other part of the question is, where does assumptive dialogue play into those things which we do not know? So. You know, neither Ed nor I was formally trained as, a, as an historian. Um, and um, we're, we're, I guess, you know, in, to academics, to formal academics, we're self-taught, gifted amateurs at best. I don't know. We've done a lot well, of work. Well, we're certainly self-taught. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is um, the lesson to be learned, and, uh, you know, from 14-year-old Ron Rietveld on to the work that we do is that you have to be relentless. Um, you have to engage with professionals, and I mean, obviously we're professionals now. Engage, discuss, find out what's missing, look, and um, uh, it, it's technology makes it much easier today. Gives you a lot of clues, but it also gives you false senses of discovery. Don't rely on anything you see on the World Wide Web unless you want to know who some obscure person is who you've heard written about, which was very useful to me. I'll tell you one quick story. There's a a moment in Abraham Lincoln's visit to uh, New York City. Uh, he has a reception. New York City, at a hotel. I I've heard of it, yes. yes. <laughs> and someone says there's a special guest here. Tom Heyer is here. And, L and Lincoln says, I hope he doesn't hit me. Well, I didn't know who Tom Heyer was. And that that's an easy thing to find out on the web. He was the undefeated heavyweight champion of the world. And Lincoln knew who he was. He was a famous boxer. I didn't know. Um, but don't rely on anything else you see. Keep, keep at it. I mean, it sound, this sounds childish, but it isn't. It isn't. And Lincoln had it right when a, lawyer, a young law student asked him, how do you become a lawyer? And Lincoln said, read the books and then study them. Work, work, work is the main thing. And, you, and that's, it's just a relentless quest. And Michael, I'm sure, would, yeah, has his no, own I'd stories. Yeah, I agree with all the above. Works. Let me, the authors will be signing in one moment. Can I ask one final question of both of you? A little bit off subject, but not, not a bad I think there's one person wrap. there. Oh, is there? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. I wanted to. That's all right. All right, I still will ask my question, but please feel free to. Thank you. Uh, my question is for all three panel members, I guess specifically for Mr. Steer. Uh, it's two questions. One, in light of uh, the fact that there was no Miranda at the time, no Miranda rights, and in light of the fact that there was no Gideon versus Wayne right, Sixth Amendment right to counsel that was really emphasized, why is it that, or it appears from what I've read from your books, that there was very little interrogation in light of today's methods, very little interrogation that's recorded. The trial was copiously recorded, but there was very little interrogation by investigators as you mentioned, there was the confession, uh, but people like Davy Harrell, who was actually caught with Booth, and Mr. Powell, who certainly uh, was strong evidence against him as far as the attempt on Secretary Stewart's life. So, Seward's life. So, but there was very little information about statements that they have may have made. One and two, uh, in light of 
Confederate Secretary Benjamin's uh, flight to London and his long life as an attorney there and a barrister, I was wondering if there's any information or if you ever found any information as to what he has written about what he knew possibly of an actual higher conspiracy. Thank you. Well, second question first. No, uh, there's nothing that comes out of Benjamin. Interestingly enough, there's little that comes out of any of these people afterwards. Um, uh, a few of them wrote books that were peripherally involved, um, but no. As to your first question, um, I have to say you're not correct there. Uh, they were interrogated extensively, and it was recorded. Uh, we have all of their statements. Uh, Davy Harrell gave a very lengthy statement. Interestingly enough, and importantly, uh, there was a system of shorthand uh, that existed in those days, uh, a system developed by a man named Isaac Pittman. And uh, his brother had opened up a phonographic institute in this country. So there were a lot of people that used this shorthand. And in our court system in the United States, we started using it in the 1950s. So 1850s. So the entire trial is recorded verbatim, uh, very accurately. But so are all of the interrogations. Uh, Dr. Mudd twice, Davy Harrell once, Mary Surratt, very lengthy interrogation recorded, Lewis Powell, um, George Atzerott, and then George Atzerott's lost confession, in which he gave a very lengthy statement, even Edmund Spangler. So no, there's, there's a lot of information that these people gave, uh, and were all recorded verbatim. We can feel re reasonably sure of that. Um, and th I wanted to say something along those lines to the gentleman over here. Um, nothing is ever as it seems. That's a little motto I have over my computer. Uh, above everything else that Harold mentioned and that Michael seconded, you have to have access. If you don't have access, there's very little you can do. And up till recently, for instance, uh, there are four major files that exist. I was going to bring them out and set them here uh, for the Lincoln assassination. The trial transcript, recorded verbatim. The evidence file, which all of the police, military, detectives, investigators gathered in order to prosecute the case. 5,007 documents. Uh, now, the trial and the evidence documents are housed in the National Archives, and in 1965 were photocopied, so they're available in microfilm. 16 reels of microfilm has all of this material in it. But that means you have to get the 16, either come here and use it, get the 16 reels, or purchase them, and they're quite expensive, and get a microfilm reader and sit at home and do it. That puts a tremendous limitation on people that might want to begin to get into this. Well, fortunately, they've all now been collated, annotated, and published in book form. So uh, you now can get the four major record groups that exist on the Lincoln assassination, the total material, the trial, the evidence, the rewards file, and the Hart Tranth book closes the ring. This is the final piece that gives you the entire Lincoln assassination primary material. And what's so exciting about this is now that every one of you, for a modest price, can get the entire... $24.95. The other book you neglected to say is inordinately expensive. It is inordinately expensive. And can just, should be just borrowed at your the, local... The evidence house. file lists at $125, but you can get it for $85 or $90. But the important thing it's is... easier to carry around, too. Yeah. <laughs> the important thing is you've got the entire Lincoln assassination primary source materials. Let's just from A to Z, 100%. Another, you can go just, home, sit in your den, and start at the beginning like we did and go through it. And I'm convinced you're going to find things that we didn't find. You're going to come at it from a different perspective. And, and we're all interested to see what happens now over the next few years that this material is so readily available to everyone. But you have to have access. That's the single most important thing. You can be the smartest investigator in the world you don't have access, it doesn't do you any good. Okay. One final brief question and a brief answer from each of you, I hope. Given the unanswered lingering questions about the Lincoln assassination and its aftermath, 
if you could get a source that either doesn't exist or has been lost, what would you love to have? Me? The missing pages of John Wilkes Booth's diary, if they were really missing. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I got good news for you. I have them, and I'll give them to you. <laughs> so, are federal marshals present? <laughs> well, I want is uh, the papers of the Confederate Secret Service in Montreal, Canada, where, where Booth went at the very beginning of putting his plot together. And, uh, and got together with two notorious agents up there, George Sanders and, and Patrick Charles uh, Martin. And I would love to be able to get hold of their papers and correspondence that these people won over in October of 1864, because I think we will find a very direct link. Right, well, one only hopes. Thank you all. <laughs> the authors will be signing outside. Remember they said you were supposed to, you were supposed to plug out there.